All right. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. So let's let's get started. So it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today. It's Sarah Ries from the University of Newcastle, and she is going to tell us something about the compressed word problem in relatively hyperbolic groups. Thank you very much, Ilya. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope somebody will shout at me if I'm, um, you know, not audible or speaking too fast or something, which I have a tendency to do. But it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but at least it's quite nice to, to communicate with you like this. Um, so what am I going to talk about today? Well, I better tell you what um, my talk's about. I better explain the words in the title and um, why I think this problem is interesting. And then um, I'm going to state my recent result um, with uh, Derek Holt, which I want to discuss. And it builds on some results of Lowry and Derek um, Lowry and Saul Schleimer um, for free and hyperbolic groups. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about those. And, and then I'm going to try and explain to you a little bit um, how the proofs work of actually all three results because our proof builds on the proof for hyperbolic groups and that proof extends the group for free groups. They're all basically using the same ideas, but just um, expanding them, okay? So, um, okay, so I better get started. So I've got a group, uh, G, fin finitely generated over a set X, and I'm assuming that X contains all the inverses of its elements. And we're all familiar with the word problem uh, for G, the word problem asks if there's an algorithm that, given any input word, decides whether or not it's equal to the identity. And you express the time complexity of the algorithm as a function of the length of the word as a string. Um, and um, so the word problem has been well studied for, for free groups. Um, it has linear time complexity. And for hyperbolic groups, it has linear time complexity. And for relatively hyperbolic groups that are re hyperbolic relative to virtually abelian subgroups, it has linear time complexity. And in fact, in all of these cases, it has real time complexity, in fact. OK, so it can be solved using a Turing machine that processes its, processes its input and gives an answer in real time. OK. So the compressed word problem asks the same problem, but when the word is input in a different way, in a compressed format, that is to say, um, in a, the word is defined by a straight line program. I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. And um, in this case, we measure the um, complexity of the, um, of the solution in, we express it in terms of the size of this straight line program, okay? So it's already known that when, um, it was already known that when G was a free group or hyperbolic, then the compressed word problem is soluble in polynomial time. And our recent result extends that to groups that are hyperbolic relative to free Arbenian subgroups. Okay, just free Arbenian subgroups. So I need to define relative hyperbolicity, though I'm sure my audience probably knows what it is. But basically, um, because I'm going to use um, the definition clearly. Uh, so a group is hyperbolic relative to a finite collection of subgroups, which are called the par its parabolic subgroups. If when you take the union of the non-identity elements in those subgroups and extend the original generating set of G, to the a bigger generating set x hat by adding in all those elements, all those non identity elements of those of those subgroups to get a set x hat. Then, if you look at the Cayley graph of the group O that is bigger um, generating set, then that new Cayley graph is delta hyperbolic for some delta. Um, so basically, you've compressed all the elements of the subgroups down to to, um, to to define edges in graph of length one, right? So you collapsed everything that's happening within any any one of the subgroups. Um, then that Cayley graph is delta hyperbolic, and then um, there's uh, what's known as the bounded coset penetration property. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, which which adds um, well an additional geometric condition, basically. Um, so, well, this is the picture of it. Um, I'm in the, it relates the Cayley graph of gamma to the Cayley graph of gamma hat in, in, in over, of, to the Cayley graph gamma hat over the bigger 
generating set in a way. So if you take um, a pair of um, quasi geodesics in the Cayley graph um, gamma hat, that is the one over the bigger generating set, um, then if you've got two quasi geodesics like that that um, begin and end together, then um, the the two quasi geodesics are, are close to each other. Each one is in some neighbourhood of the other. And then if you take the sections of that which stay within a coset of one of the parabolics, then they match up basically. So if you take long enough sections, these are called um, components, these the sections that stay within a, a coset, then, then they match up if there's one on one quasar geodesic, there's a corresponding one of, over on the other geodesic and, um, and they begin and end close together within um, where, where now distance is, or where distance was always measured actually, um, in term, in the over the original generators x. I didn't say that very well, but I think you're probably all familiar with this condition. Anyway, we are assuming that the bounded coset penetration property holds um, for our relatively hyperbolic group, which is the stronger condition of relatively hyperbolicity that most people I think um, use most of the time. Okay, so obviously. Um, if um, we don't have any of these um, parabolic subgroups, if we have an empty set of parabolic subgroups, then this collapses to the definition of hyperbolicity. And if we set delta to be zero, then we get the definition of a free group, right? Okay, so we need, when we're dealing with relative hyperbolicity, then we need always to relate the Cayley graph over the original generating set X to the Cayley graph over the extended generating set that contains all the non-identity elements of the parabolic subgroups. So, um, so we need to relate words over, over the generators of X to words over the generators um, X hat. So a word over the generate over either generating set is a string of elements from that generating set. And because um, we're building here on work of uh, Marcus Lowry, who, Lowry, who's a computer scientist, and Saul Schleimer, who's worked with a computer scientist, um, our words are indexed from zero. So a word of length then is a string where the first um, element of the word is called a zero uh, and the last one is called a and minus one. Okay. And um, we are using the notation of um, Schleimer and Lowry in their earlier work um, and denoting a subword, um, the subword that starts at ai and finishes at aj minus one using this strange um, bracket notation here, a i colon j with a square bracket at the beginning and a round bracket at the end, okay? And um, so where the um, where I've got a, a prefix of the word, so it starts um, at zero, then I'll often leave that zero off. So I'll just write it like here, like I've done here. And if I'm going all the way to the end of the word, I'll leave out the thing, the um, integer n from our notation as well, which is useful if I don't actually know what n is, to be perfectly honest. Anyway, so the, that's how we denote a subword. Um, and if we've got a word over the generating set x, then there's an associated word over the larger generating set x hat, where we've added in all the elements of the parabolics um, as, as follows. So if we... Um, so if W um, can be split up so that certain subwords um, of W are written over generators in one of the parabolics, then those subwords are called components of the word. And um, when we got such a, a string over generators within one of the element um, within one of the parabolics, then we could replace it by the element of that parabolic. Um, that that word represents, and we have then um, a word over the larger generating set x hat, which we call the derived word corresponding to the original word w. So to each word w of the original gen of the generators x, we have a derived word over the larger generating set x hat, which is of course um, generally rather shorter than the original word w because strings from w have been replaced by single elements of the parabolic subgroups, okay? So that's called the derived word w hat. And in order to um, 
to deal with the to say meaningful things about the compressed web problem, which we haven't actually defined properly yet, I guess, because we haven't defined straight line programs, I think. Um, we, we're going to need to use the hyperbolic geometry in the Cayley graph over the set x hat. And so we're going to need to deal with the relationship between words over x, which is you know what the input to our problem um, is, and words over x hat, um, which are which label paths in the Cayley graph over x hat, where we're finding the hyperbolic geometry. So we're going to need to deal with that relationship. Um, but we're going to be, in particular, we're going to meet with the subwords, many of the subwords that we're going to meet um, of the input word W um, will be interested in, in the ones which um, which don't split the components of W. You'll see why later. Um, so that is to say, words of the form. Um, Definitely should really be. Yeah, they should really. So words where the um, the subwords over the, that, that that appear in subgroups are, are are there in their entirety and haven't been split. And um, when that happens, um, the um, derived word sub, the derived word corresponding to the subword w prime of w will be a subword of the derived word corresponding to W itself, because, because the components of W have been transferred in their entirety. And so that means that, so when you've got such a subword, then you'll be able to find um, integers K and L so that the, the derived subword, yeah, is, is expressed, is, is starts at the Kth um, word of W hat and finishes at the elf, sorry, the, the kth letter of W hat and finishes at the elf letter of W hat because, because it doesn't start in the middle of one of those letters, if you see what I mean. So, so any subword of W obviously is of the form Wij, but if, if it hasn't split components, then its derived word is of the form W hat of KL. And I'm interested in that um, because of what we're going to do with this. And so I've got a special notation to deal with it. So when I've got um, uh, Sarah, I have w, curious. Does that make sense? Could I ask you? Uh, so I'm I'm missing something. So basically, you replace you are replacing these betas by uh, H's, right? And yeah, I think my notation. Beta about H's, like what is, uh, like. H is a H is an element of the subgroup. Okay, so I've got a string. I've got a string that represents, I'm sorry, I'm not at my best at nine o'clock at night. I got a string that, that is a word over X, okay, which is W, and sequences of symbols within that word, maybe within a subgroup. And um, if you've got a string of, um, of symbols within W, all from the same subgroup, then I can replace that string by the element of the subgroup, by that, by that string, represents and then I will have have made I've constructed the derived word um, over a larger generating set which contains all the elements of the subgroup right of the subgroups uh -huh. and, and which also which represents the same string which represents the same element but it's over a larger generating set so, so basically like this word like in the bottom of the page this is in the okay, so this, this word at the bottom of the, i think um if i'd seen this slide when i was looking at my food h i wouldn't have called it h prime i'd have called it betas actually so so w prime is supposed to be a subword of w where the strings that were over subgroups have not been broken into pieces they haven't it hasn't split any of them okay uh -huh, it's, okay. A, it's a subword of w but the the strings within W that were, were so over generated. One letter, basically, instead of the string, you have one letter. Now that, that should really be us. Like instead of the, stri the string, like so beta was a word and it's, H is a letter, right? Yeah, I think that, that's a typo, basically, is what I'm trying to say. W prime is supposed to be a, a subword of W, okay? And I shouldn't have called it H, I should have called it beta. 
That was a mistake. Ah, okay. 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 So, so W prime is a subword of W. And, and, I, and I chose it in such a way that I've not split the components. And what I'm and when that happens, mm -hmm. then the derived word corresponding to W prime will be a subword of the derived word corresponding to W. That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay. Okay, okay sorry, it's my very bad notation and I I missed it when I was checking through my slides earlier. Okay. So W prime is supposed to be a subword that doesn't split components. And when that happens, the corresponding derived word is a subword of the other derived word. The derived words match up as subwords, just as the original words did. Okay? Okay. Sorry, sorry about that. And the point of, of saying all this is that in that case, um, there are, so just as there is a pair of integers i and j that specify W prime as a subword of W, there's also a pair of integers k and l which specify the w prime hat as a subword of w hat do you see what i mean there's a second pair of integers that specifies the subword but actually it specifies the derived word corresponding to the subword as a subword of the derived word corresponding to the original word right so there's w prime and w but there's also w prime hat and w hat there's a pair of integers that specifies w prime as a subword of w there's another pair of words that specifies w prime hat as a subword of w hat and i'm interested in that pair of integers too and so i have a special notation so i say that w prime is w double brackets of kl although i already know that w prime is w single brackets of ij I've got this other notation that says that W prime is W of double brackets of KL because I might know those that pair of integers KL when I don't know the pair of integers IJ. Do you see what I mean? So it's just a different pair of integers that that, that um, allows me to define the same subword of W. And oh, thank you. Somebody says they understand. Susan, thank you. Okay, so, so what's a straight line program? A straight line program is a compressed format for specifying a word. It's a, it's a mechanism for specifying a word. It's a recipe that specifies a word. It's actually a context-free grammar. Okay, so I have um, a start state, a start variable. I have a map that replaces each, when, each variable by, well, a production, basically, which project replaces each variable by a string of variables and um, generators. And, um, and then I have um, an, an order um, relation on um, V, the set of variables, which says that one variable is bigger than another variable if the second one the smaller one occurs in when i apply this production multiple times to a then i'll get you know ultimately i'll get a, a, a sequence of, of strings and and b if b occurs in one of those it's it's kind of down the road from a then i say it's less than or equal to um a anyway that that relation has to be a cycle so basically i've got a tree associated with these productions okay and the leaves of the tree, ultimately, when I keep applying the productions again and again and again, eventually everything will become words over the, the variables will disappear and I'll, I'll get words over the generators. Okay, so it's just a context free grammar. So then the size of this straight line program, this context free grammar is the, is the total length of all the productions of, of all the variables in the grammar, right? And the purpose of this of this straight line program, this context free grammar, is to produce a word. So the um, the word is the that it produces is is the word that you eventually get as the concatenation of all the leaves of the tree that you get by applying this grammar. And that's called the value of the straight line program, the value of the grammar. Okay. So you just keep applying all the productions until you got rid of all the variables, and then the concatenation of all the leaves in the tree um, is the value of the grammar of the straight line program. 
So it is just a grammar and you can put it into Chomsky normal form, which you can do, you can do it in polynomial time. Um, and of course there are intermediate variables you get in the, in the grammar and the value of any one of those is the concatenation of all the leaves of the tree that you get from that point onwards. And I think we'd better have an example. Okay, so let's see an example. Here it is. All right. So this is the straight line program that produces a word of the form AB to the two to the N. Okay, so we have um, N plus one variables. The first one is A zero, and each variable has, there's a production that maps it to the next variable doubled up, right? So A zero goes to A one, A one, A one goes to A two, A two, A two goes to A three, A three. Um, but then ultimately a n goes to the string a b, and so this grammar produces uh, the word a b to the two to the n. I think it is, isn't it? Yes, a b to the two to the n. And the each of the that's the um, value of a zero, but the value of a one would be a b to the two to the n minus one. The value of a two is a b to the two to the n minus two, and so on. Okay, so this is how this is a compact way of generating the word a b to the two to the m, which is also obviously quite a long word. I think it might be of length two to the n plus one or something. But this um, grammar that generates has total size two times n plus one. Okay, so it's a more compact way of representing that word. Okay, so. So why are we interested in this? Well, Sorschleimer proved in 2008 that if you have a finitely generated group and then a finitely generated subgroup of its automorphism group, then the word problem for, the, for this finitely generated subgroup of the automorphism group of G can be reduced in polynomial time to the compressed word problem for G itself. And therefore it was, proved using this result that the word problem for the automorphism group, the free group, is soluble in polynomial time. So how is this proved? Okay, so you see that um, that an automorphism um, of G is the identity automorphism if and only if for each of the generators of G, that automorphism fixes that generator. So for each generator xi of g, xi to the minus one times the image under xi of xi is equal to the identity element. Okay. So if you take any expression for your automorphism psi as a word over the generators um, of A, so as a word of form of alpha I1 up to alpha I n then you can derive a straight line program for um, xi applied to xi um, use as, well, there is an, uh, as follows, okay? So basically the, the, the straight line, yeah, the, straight, the purpose of the straight line program is to, is to um, generate the word xi of xi. And then it's um, elementary, to derive from this straight line program, a straight line program that derives xi to the minus one psi of xi. So you just have a chain of variables that track the image of um, xi through, through the word um, one piece at a time, through the word that represents psi, one piece at a time, okay? So this is, um, this is a straight line program for psi of xi, and then just by concatenating it with xi to the minus one, you get a straight line program for xi to the minus one psi of xi. You can do this for each of the xi's, and so you can solve the word problem um, for the um, for the automorphism group, provided you can solve the compressed word problem. Um, for each of these finitely many um, straight line programs, okay. So, in, so this is a reduction of the word problem of the automorphism group A to the compressed word problem for G, okay. And so then, since it was proved by 
um, Laurie that um, the compressed word problem for the free group is soluble in polynomial time. And since it's known that the automorphism group of the free group is finitely generated, you can derive from this result that the automorphism, the word problem for the automorphism group of the free group is soluble in polynomial time. So it's a consequence of Lowry's proof that the compressed word problem for the free group is soluble in polynomial time. So that's one motivation for studying the compressed word problem. But um, it also, there are various other um, word problem questions that are reduced to compressed word problem questions. So the word problem for a semi-direct product of, of two groups reduces in log space and so also in polynomial time to a combination of the word problem of the top group Q and the um, bottom group, the compressed word problem of the bottom group, the normal subgroup K. And um, so then various groups are shown to have polynomial time word problem because various other groups have polynomial time compressed word problems such as free groups and word hyperbolic groups, which I've already mentioned, finite generated non-potent groups, or virtually special groups, and so coxter groups or fully residually free groups and fundamental groups of hyperbolic free manifolds. So various groups are known to have Sarah, uh, why does why why finitely generated nilpotent groups have uh, polynomial time uh, compressed word problem? I, I, I don't remember I don't remember where whose proof it is to be looking on the I'm sorry. Um, okay. But um, I could find out, but I'm sure I, I must have um, got that from um, Laurie's book, I think. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Okay. Not at nine o'clock on a Friday anyway. But um, it's, it's um, I think it must be in Laurie's book. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not in today's talk. Okay. It's, it's just a fact. Okay, but it's not, I mean, the first word problem isn't always easy. But it's easy for these groups. Okay. So um, Thompson's group F has a very nasty compressed word problem. But its word problem is not so bad. Okay. So or maybe, maybe that I might have got this stuff. There's also, um, no, I think it must have come from Lowry's book, but I'm not sure. Okay. So our result is. Um, proves that the compressed word problem for a group that's hyperbolic relative to a finite collection of free abelian, so they're all free abelian subgroups, is soluble in polynomial time. Okay, and we extend basically the work of Lowry for free groups and Holt, Lowry and Schleimer for hyperbolic groups. We use basically the same ideas, but it's harder. Okay, it's harder because the geometry is harder. It's still the same basic idea, but we have to work hard to get the geometry to work. And well, and a couple of other things as well. Okay, but it's basically the geometry is harder. So, so the, the basic idea is the same in all three proofs. Okay, so you've got a group and it has a nice normal form. Three groups have really good normal forms, right? Hyperbolic groups have really good normal forms. Relatively hyperbolic groups have quite nice normal forms. Okay, so we have a good normal form for our group. And what's important is that the representative in that normal form of the identity element is the empty word. Okay, so, so we're starting with a straight line program that generates a word W. And um, we can assume that this straight line program is quite well behaved. We'll assume it's in Chomsky normal form and generally has good properties. And the, but the point is, if you have a straight line program and it doesn't have all these good properties, in polynomial time, you can, you can convert it into one that does have the good properties you want. So you can assume to start with that it has good properties. Okay, so we so that's our input, a straight line program that generates W. Okay, and the idea is to construct a new straight line program that generates the normal form of W. Because remember the identity element um, in normal form is represented by the empty word. Okay, and we can generally, recognize the empty word, we know when we got the empty word. So, um, so the 
normal form of W will be the empty word if and only if W itself is the identity element. Okay. And so that's what we have to do. We have to construct a straight line program, a new straight line program that generates the normal form of the input word. And we, well, we, so we work through the tree. We work through the production tree corresponding to this straight line program, which remember is in Chomsky normal form. And so the basic productions in this tree are of the form A goes to BC. And so what we have to do is we have to know what to do um, to the productions in the tree of the form A goes to BC in order to create the productions in the tree that generates the normal form of W instead of W. We're going to do this conversion and we're going to convert it one production at a time. And the productions are basically in general of the form A goes to BC, okay? So, so what happens in the free group? All right, in the free group, we got a production of the form A goes to BC. That means, uh, so if B um, has value U and C has value V, then um, we've got to, for, for, in order to, so the, we've got to convert U to its normal form um, and V to its normal form. And then having done that, in order to find the production, we've got a, a production form A goes to BC. In order to, to deal with that production to get the, the new straight line program for the normal form, we have to find the normal form of, um, of UV. If U is in normal form and V is in normal form, we have to find out how the normal form um, of U and V relates to U and V. And the point is, if we're in the free group, then if U is a word U1, U2, and V is a word V1, V2, then, um, sorry, no, I haven't said that very well. What, what, when you, the normal form of two words, U and, of the product concatenation of two words, U and V, you basically cancel out anything um, at the end of U that, that is inverse to stuff at the beginning of V, right? And so basically the normal form of the concatenation U, V is of the form U1, V2, where U1 is a prefix of U and V2 is a suffix of V, and the suffix U2 of U um, is inverse to the prefix V1 of V, right? You're just cancelling out the stuff in the middle. That's how you do deal with things in free groups. But in hyperbolic and relatively hyperbolic groups, it's not quite as simple as that, right? But, but at least you have negative curvature going on, and so you use that to help you um, deal with this concatenation stuff. Does that make any sense? Maybe. Okay, so that's what we have to do. In free groups, we have to do cancellation. In hyperbolic and relatively hyperbolic groups, we have to somehow, in some other way, given a pair of words that are in normal form, figure out what the normal form for their concatenation looks like. Okay, so um, we're uh, going to- Sorry, uh, I thought that in the free group, uh, don't you also need to know whether the normal form is trivial or not, uh, you know, because it might not be obvious. Uh, or... oh, no, we've chosen a normal form where the represent, but the identity is the empty word. Um... We choose our normal form carefully. And the normal form in the free group is, is freely reduced words. Sorry, I think I might have omitted to say that. So okay. in free groups, we have a very nice normal form. We have freely reduced, um, words that are freely reduced, and then the representative, the identity is the empty word. In, a, in hyperbolic groups, we have very nice normal forms. We just take all, well, we can take all GD. Uh, uh, yes, that's not what I meant. I meant uh, uh, you should be able to tell whether or not the normal form uh, will be uh, trivial without actually computing it, right? You, you don't want to run the, the straight line program. You want to be able to tell whether or not normal form will be trivial. Uh, oh, um, it turns out we can tell in, if we have a straight line program, I think we're coming to that, then we can tell in polynomial time whether the, whether the value of a straight line program is the empty word. Uh, all right, so that, that's- Okay, that's, that's something we can do in polynomial time. There are some things we can do in polynomial time and checking to see whether the output is the empty word, is, is the empty word, not just a represent, but actually the empty word is something we can do in polynomial time. Okay, yeah. That's good. Okay, so that's how, right? Okay. So, so, um, so that's, thank you. Okay, so so we're going to have to build this, this, this straight line program and we actually do it in three stages. 
because it's quite tricky to build it unless we have some extra tricks. So we we, we use our extra tricks um, to build not just a, not actually a straight line program, but something that's called a tethered cut straight line program, um, which is more. So it's it's it, we have extra machinery, and so it's a slightly more complex um, device, a complex grammar. It's got these extra production types of productions in it, but it's easier to build, and um, it's also more compact. Um, and so things haven't blown up so much, and then we. We have to convert it and, and get rid of the extra tricks, the extra types of productions, and turn it into, into an ordinary straight line program, which you do in two steps, right? So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to explain that in a second. As, as usual, my, I'm running out of time. I always run out of time, which is always good because it means I don't have to do the tricky stuff at the end. All right. But anyway, so, so that's, I'll, I'll give you more detail and then I think it would be clearer. Okay. So we're going, to, we're going to add two extra tricks, right? And the first extra trick that we're going to add is we're going to, rough, we're going to add extra operators, which are called cut operators. So we're going to allow productions of the form A goes to B, I, J, so which define a subword, right? So, so if I have a production of this type, then the value at, at the end of the variable a the, the the ultimate output from the from the variable a is formed from the ultimate output of the variable b by taking the subword of it that starts at i and finishes at j minus one okay so the value of the variable a is taken is the subword of the value b defined by the pair of integers i and j if we have such a production in our straight line program okay we're adding extra operators extra types of production to our straight line program, and they're called cut operators, and this is the way they work. So why are we why are we wanting to do this? Well, remember how we solved the um, compressed word problem in free group, right? We 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 freely reduce the concatenation of um, of a word u and a word v by taking the first part of u and the last part of v and sticking them together. So what we're doing is we're applying, well, we're taking a subword of length, we're cancelling a subword of length k in the middle of the two words, right? So we're taking the prefix of the first word of length um, n1 minus k and concatenating it with the um, subword with the suffix of the second word of length n2 minus k. So we're concatenating this subword with of v1, which is a prefix of v1, with this subword of v2, which is a suffix of v2. So we're concatenating the output of two cut operators, basically. So if if the um, so if we add cut operators to our uh, what's the word to our toolkit, then we can build very easily the um, given a, the straight line program that recognizes the free reduction of a word if out of the straight line program that generates the word itself, right? If we allow cut operators. And that's how Lowry um, solved the compressed word problem in the free group. He added cut operators to his toolkit in order to build out of a straight line program for a word, the straight line, straight line program for its free reduction, then all he had to do was modify that straight line, straight line program subsequently to get rid of the cut operators. Okay, so that's how he solved the compressed word problem in free groups. Okay, but um, actually, so well, when I'm, we're gonna have cut operators to deal with things for our relatively hyperbolic groups, but um, we're going to need to specify uh, subwords that relate to subwords of um, of W that relate to the its associated derived word, and so um, we'll sometimes need to specify those words using this double bracket notation that I mentioned earlier. So we'll we'll want to allow our cut operators to have that form as well, so that the subword they specify is specified by that other pair of numbers rather than the original. I really should put K and L in here. That's it's. Yeah, you just never stop finding typos on the slides, do you? But I mean, I hope you know what I mean. 
Okay, so anyway, cut operators aren't going to be enough to do what we need to do. Actually, we're going to need something else as well. Because, of course, in a hyperbolic group, or, or in a, certainly not in a relatively hyperbolic group, if you want to find the normal form, the if you want to find the geodesic representative of the concatenation of two geodesics, then you just don't you don't just find it by cancelling out stuff in the middle, right? In in um, hyperbolic groups, you have hyperbolic triangles, and so you may have let's have a picture. I'm sure there's a picture somewhere. There it is. All right. In a hyperbolic group, you can have a geodesic V1 here and a geodesic V2 there. And then their concatenation is represented by a geodesic V3 here. But it's obviously not just formed out by cancelling stuff in the middle. They're the, the three um, words, V1, V2 and V3, are sides of a hyperbolic triangle, right? So life is more complicated in the hyperbolic groups than it is in free groups. But never mind, because we have a hyperbolic triangle here. Which is a, it's thin because hyperbolic triangles are. And I've drawn the meeting points D1, D2 and D3, right, which are close together. OK, D1 is close to D2, D2 is close to D3 and D1 is close to D3 as well. They're all within distance delta of each other. OK, so. Um, all right. So in that case, what we can do is, so we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to find um, the, the geodesic V3, um, the short lex geodesic V3, um, that represents the um, element of the hyperbolic group that is the product of the element represented by the short lex geodesic V1 and the short lex geodesic V2. Okay, so we draw this, this um, hyperbolic triangle here. And of course, the, the word V3 is the concatenation of um, its prefix that goes here from, from A to A3, followed by its middle section that goes from A3 to C3, and followed by its suffix that goes from C3 here to C. So I haven't told you what any of these letters represent yet. Okay, but anyway, so, as you, as you are, because this is a, a hyperbolic triangle, um, as you move out from the vertex A, there, um, the, um, the, 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 the um, corresponding vertices on, on the path V1 and V3 stay are, are, are close, right? And um, as you move out from C, corresponding vertices on um, V3 and V2 are close, and, and similarly as you move out from B, right? So what I've shown here are corresponding vertices on the pairs of paths, and I've called them A1 and A3, B1 and B2, and C1 and C2. And so the... Um, the prefix of V3 that goes from A to A3 is um, the short lex minimal representative of the prefix of V1 that goes from A to A1, um, followed by this little word, the short word, um, which I've called zeta here, but I've gone backwards along it, right? So the, the prefix of V3 that labels the path from A to A3 is the short lex minimal representative of the word um, that's a prefix of V1 followed by zeta to the minus one here, okay? And then um, obviously the, the word here labeled from A3 to C3 is a, a section of the verb of the word V3. And then, oh, but that's not the one I want. Uh, but the, no, this, this section V3 could be also is equal to, it's the short lex minimal representative of zeta times this middle section of V1 times this word eta, times this middle section of V2 times theta to the minus one. And then this suffix here of V3 is equal to the short legs minimal representative of theta times this suffix here of V2. So, so the word V3 can be written as a concatenation of um, short legs minimal representatives of three words that can be formed out of sections within V1 and V2, okay? so. So V3 itself can be 
expressed as a concatenation of words that are associated with, um, with the words V1 and V2, which we know all about, and with some short little words, okay? So, so this basically expresses the, um, the word V3 in terms of things that can be built out of the words V2 using the cut operator. And well, there's some conjugation and normal form stuff going on here. And, um, and this is what we call tethering, okay? So what's tethering? So if you've got a normal form for words over X, then the tether operator takes, um, adds productions of the form a goes, well, A goes to B, right, angle bracket, alpha, beta, what does that do? If B has value, um, if, if the value of B is, well, is the value of B, then the tether operator, the, the value of A when, when you have a, an operator like this is the normal form of alpha times the value of B times beta to the minus one. So, you, you conjugate the, well, it's not a conjugate, you, multi, you pre multiply the value of B by a short word and post multiply it by another short word and take the normal form of that composite. And that gives you the value of A when you have such a tether operator. Does that make any sense? So the point is that if we add operators of this form, we can, as you, as you saw, we can express the the um, short legs minimal representative of V1 and V2 in terms of the values, the short legs minimal representatives of, of, of the individual words V1 and V2. So we found a way of, um, of deriving the, of, of dealing with, um, Productions of the form A goes to BC in hyperbolic groups using this operator and using a mixture of this operator and the cut operator. So the, the compressed word problem for hyperbolic groups is solved using a mixture of cut operators and these tether operators here. Okay. So of course you can, if you allow tether operators and cut operators, then you so you you, um, you form tethered straight line programs by adding the tether operator. You find you form cut straight line programs for adding the cut operator, and you form tethered cut straight line programs by adding both of them, okay? So as, as I essentially just showed you on the last slide, if you've got, if you've got a production of the form A goes to BC, then um, if you can, um, if, if um, B basically gives you the, um, if, you, if you can find the, the um, normal form of the output of B, and you can find the normal form of the output of C, then you find the normal form, uh, sorry, the short legs minimal form for the, outlet, the output of B, C, um, using this construction here, because, we find the word as concatenation of the output of this operator, the output, followed by the output of this operator, followed by the output of that operator. Okay, and this is how Holt, Lowry, and Schleimer dealt with hyperbolic groups. I've only got 10 minutes left, haven't I? Okay, so, so essentially, our proof uses the ideas of the um, Holt, Laurie Schleimer proof for hyperbolic groups. And the only thing is that things are trickier. So what they had was they had hyperbolic triangles in the Cayley graph, and that's how they were able to deal with productions of the form A goes to BC. They were able to replace the value of, to, to, to express the, the value of A as a concatenation of the values of B and C. Right. Um, so they were able to use that negative curvature 
to, to deal with those productions. And they were able to use the normal form that was short legs minimal GOD6. When we don't have that, we don't have a negatively curved Cayley graph, but we do have a negatively curved, curved Cayley graph over the larger generating set. And we don't have um, short legs minimal GOD6 that are tremendously well behaved. But we do have some automaticity going on and putting the two together, we can deal with this. So the, 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 since we don't have short legs minimal GOD6, we find something to replace that. And we replace the short legs minimal GOD6 in the, in the um, hyperbolic group with an asynchronous biautomatic structure. So that's to say we have a regular set of words that satisfies an asynchronous fellow traveler property. Uh, this is supposed to be a picture of the asynchronous fellow traveler property. Okay, I've got a couple of words um, that are in a nice regular language um, that covers the group. And I'm showing two words here that um, go from the identity in the Cayley graph to neighboring vertices. And you can see they stay close to each other, but they stay close to each other asynchronously because the word on the top is rather longer than the word on the bottom, but it, it still stays close to it if it sort of um, doesn't, if it moves faster. If you move faster along the top word than along the bottom word, you can keep the two words in track, in sync, right? So you move asynchronously through the two words and they stay close together, okay? And similarly, we want um, two words that start next to each other and finish in the same place to say close to each other in the same way. OK, so um, relatively hyperbolic groups are known to have synchronous by automatic structures that are very well behaved, but unfortunately they don't work for us. They don't have all the properties that we need. So we had to build our own. OK, so we had to build our own, which, um, well, we needed things to work well with relate in relation to the um, Cayley graph over the larger generating set. And so um, we actually needed an automatic structure where the um, we're not the we didn't need the normal form for an element to be geodesic, but we need to the derived um, word of something in normal form to be geodesic in the enlarged Cayley graph, the Cayley graph over the larger set. Okay. And we also needed subwords to work quite well. So we needed the components. Remember, those are the bits and subgroups. We needed those subwords of words in normal form that were within the Arbidian, free Arbidian subgroups. We needed them to be very nice looking. I mean, free Arbidian groups have very nice biautomatic structures. And so we needed those subwords of our words in normal form to, to be well behaved. And basically, we needed we needed good behavior of subwords. We didn't. We couldn't expect that our automatic structure um, was subword closed, but we needed the right subwords to be within in normal form. The ones that we were really interested in, we wanted to be particularly well behaved. Okay, but we couldn't make it a synchronous automatic structure by automatic structure. That was too much to help for. But we was good enough if it was asynchronously if it satisfied an asynchronous fellow travel property. Okay, so um. Ah, yes, well, that's a that's a lemma. Um, but I think we don't need the lemma because we're really running out of time. I've got six six minutes left. But there is a lemma that basically relates um, the two Cayley graphs, okay? And that's what this lemma is for, okay? So lots of things can be done in polynomial time with using straight line programs. As, as Ilya already asked, he said, well, what about, you know, recognizing the, um, the empty word? And, and the point is that if you have, one of the things you can um, do in polynomial time, if you've got a straight line program for a word, you can compute its output in polynomial time. You can test if its output is in the language of a particular um, uh, finite state automaton. So you can recognize whether or not it's in the normal form that's defined by that. Um, you can, you can, um, uh, you can turn your, straight line program into a well-behaved one that doesn't have any bad features and is in Chomsky normal form. You can compute subwords of it. I'm sure you can recognize the, the empty word, but I, I guess that that's sort of included in, um, in, in one of these as a subcase, but, but I'm sure you can. Okay, so you can, there are various things you can do. 
Um, I'm going. I'm going to skip this actually, because it's all right. I'm going to tell you how we prove it. So what do we do? We input a straight line program, right? And we construct um, a, a straight line program. Well, it, that's got tether and cut operations in it that recognize that generates instead of the original word um, w uh, that generates its normal form. Okay. And then we have to convert it, we can make it really nice, lots of good properties, and then we convert it. First of all, we get rid of the cut operators in this straight line program. And then having got rid of the cut operators, we get rid of the tethering stuff as well. And that leaves us with a straight line, an ordinary straight line program whose value is the normal form of the original word that the original straight line program generated. And so we can recognize whether or not it is the empty word okay but the trick is the geometry and the geometry for relatively hyperbolic groups works much the same actually as it does for hyperbolic groups it's just it's all worse okay so where are we all right so da -da -da -da. The, what we have to deal with is the um productions of the form A goes to BC. So we assume that we can deal with the variables B and C. That is that we've already converted the, out, the um, straight line program from B onwards um, to, to one that recognizes the normal form of B and the straight line program from C onwards to one that recognizes the normal form for C. And now we've got to do it for A, okay? So of course, we're gonna have a hyperbolic triangle and here it is. All right, so so here is V1, which is the output from B, and there's V2, which is the output for C, and um, there's V3, which is going to be, which is, you know, the normal form of the concatenation of V1 and V2, and is going to replace, be the output of the, um, ultimately, of A when we've transformed our um, straight line program. Okay, so what we want is a hyperbolic triangle, and luckily we've got one, because if we move into the Cayley graph over the larger generating set, we have one. So here we are inside the Cayley graph, and um, we have at least negative curvature when we use the larger generating set, okay? So these, so somewhere on this triangle, there are points D1, D2, and D3 that are close over, um, the larger generating set x hat. And we just have to find, we have to find essentially the same points that we found in the original hyperbolic triangle, but we have to relate the distances from, um, from gamma to, uh, between gamma and gamma hat and find the corresponding points that we need, although within gamma, although it's only in gamma hat that we have the hyperbolic geometry. And essentially we can do the same thing. I'm clearly running out of time. So, but we get the same triangle. We can, we can express V3 as the same kind of concatenation. We can do everything we did in the hyperbolic groups, but um, although the normal form is, is no longer geodesics, and but we, because it's an automatic structure, we have the fellow traveling, which helps us because we need geometry to help us, right? And the negative curvature of gamma hat, we can harness to make it all work. And so basically it does work. And I have, it is now 10 o'clock, at least 10 o'clock here. And so I think I have to, I've got to the end and I should just say, thank you for listening. I'm sorry if it was a bit muddled, but it's incredibly technical. But the basic idea is, is that yes, it works. It works because we've still got the negative curvature and instead of the geodesics that we have in hyperbolic groups, we have an automatic structure that is sufficiently well behaved that it connects to the geometry and makes it all work. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah, thank you. All right, okay. Uh, if there are any questions, you're welcome to ask them now. Uh, Sarah, what is like with membership problem? 
what is known about the membership problem? Uh, I mean, compressed membership problem. So what would the compressed membership problem be? I mean, if, uh, okay, if uh, the subgroup is given by, subgroup generators are given by compressed words, for example, even in a free group. Uh, I think in the free group, uh, if the rank of the subgroup is bounded, uh, it's still known because I mean, there are results, uh, as I remember, which say that uh, the Stolling's folding algorithm still uh, works for compressed words uh, in polynomial times if the number of generators of the subgroup is fixed. Uh, uh, really? I, like, I mean, who, who's this? Ah, ah, if the number of generators. Uh, I'm blanking out, but I, I remember uh, it's been a paper fairly recently by somebody. Uh, but if the number of generators are fixed, well, uh, it's uh, what's his name, Marco Linton. You know, so somebody from from the UK, right? So Sarah, you should know this. Uh, so who is this? Marco Linton. I think it's a student of Sol 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 Schleimer, right? Ma Linton. Uh, Linton. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, Linton, uh, I think he has a result. I, I think he's a graduate student of Sol Schlemmer. So, and the result I think is that so if you fix the number k of elements in a free group, uh, you know, um, you have k straight line programs which give you the generators, then you somehow can compute the. Um, you can perform the Stolling's folding algorithm, uh, you know, with this compressed words in polynomial time, uh, and the, the, the degree of the polynomial somehow depends on k, I think linearly even, you know, and then after that, I believe you can perform, uh, you can do the membership problem, uh, you know, sort of. That's very nice. Uh, but if K is not bounded, it, it somehow, uh, at least, uh, uh, I think it becomes a problem. Uh, so sorry, what was K? K was the... K is the number of generators of the subgroup. Um, you know, so you, you have this, so in, in the membership problem, you, you have uh, you have the element V, and then you have the generators V1, VK of the subgroup, right? Uh, you know, uh -huh. so... Uh, and I think if this number k is not assumed to be fixed or bounded, then it becomes a problem. You know, if, if k is like two or three or five uh, and this number five is fixed, then I think everything somehow still works in polynomial time, you know. So th that's my memory of things about the free group. And what happens if the number of generators of the subgroup is not bounded? I don't know that they have an actual negative result, but I think uh, what they have indicates that there shouldn't be a polynomial bound there, uh, you know, so that's my, that's what I recall. That's very interesting. interesting yeah. Uh, but, but I think in the free group, one should expect that, right? Because, or, or I mean, it should be expected that something like that. So, so a source student looked at the free group, but he do, hasn't gone beyond the free group? Uh, yeah, but already in the free group, I mean, there are difficulties because, uh, uh, like, the topology of the graph itself, the topology in the Stolling folding process, uh, there are, uh, um, I mean, one can, I mean, one can understand why something like that might be a problem, right? You know, because you start performing Stolling's folds and just the topological complexity of the graph uh, in terms of like the number of essential vertices. Can create an issue, uh, you know. So, and I think they run into this problem, uh, you know. So, uh, and I believe that uh, in an arbitrary hyperbolic group, even if it's very nice, like a surface group, I mean, the, the same kind of issues they, they should manifest. Oh, certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so uh, uh, even the, if this is already a problem in the free group case, I can imagine. No, no, certainly, certainly, yes. If it is a problem, I mean, I, I did not know that there are negative, like. I mean, it's not like a definitive negative result, but I think it's yeah, a but... indication that the full version, if the number of generators is unrestricted, that there is some kind of a difficulty. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I thought you were going my... to ask me about the conjugacy problem. I wasn't expecting a subgroup membership problem. But... What about conjugacy problem, Lex? What, what, uh... Well, somebody, somebody well, else like that last time I talked. Um, so the um, no, no. So the conjugacy problem. Because so somebody pointed out that um, the conjugacy problem in 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 hyperbolic groups reduces, doesn't it, to the um, compressed word problem for hyperbolic groups. In the I think the. The Epstein Holt solution of the process, right? The conjugacy problem in um, in hyperbolic groups is a 
quickly reduces to the compressed word fragment hyperbolic groups, I believe. And that's how they show it to be polynomial time, in effect. Well, they show it to be better than polynomial time, of course. But, but, um, but their solution to the conjugacy problem in, in free groups is such a reduction. And so um, I think one can do, no, that's not a compressed word conjugacy problem, is it? But I think one can compress, one can reduce the, just as the automorphism problem for free groups can be reduced to the compressed word problem in free groups, the conjugacy problem. Ah, so the conjugacy is another The conjugacy problem is another one that can be reduced to. But compressed conjugacy, I don't know. What do we mean by compressed conjugacy? Well, I mean, if the inputs are given by two compressed words, and we know that we want to know if they oh, right. Do we want to? Know? Okay, okay. So, so I don't know. This is, yeah. this, is, this is all very hard, isn't it? So I don't know. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's um, question, um, you know, so uh, I actually I had another question. So uh, 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 sorry about your result. Uh, so uh, I wonder. Uh, so how how uh, and whether exactly does it come into play that the uh, peripheral subgroups are free abelian? You know, so why is that? Important? Uh, oh yes. How but, important is it? What's the deal there? All right. So the problem with so so we kind of feel we ought to be able to deal with abelian. But the difficulty with moving from free abelian to abelian is obviously, I mean, it's all incredibly technical, right? But, but the, um, if, you, if you move from free abelian to abelian, then you might have some intersection in the parabolics. So, but uh, oh, what part okay. of the argument do you need this for? I mean, where does it come up? Uh, uh, so, so. Well, I, th I think this is basically, uh, in general, it's in the construction of the automatic structure to oh, make I these see. work. So. That's so, so we have to, it was really quite fiddly to make the automatic structure work or the bioautomatic structure work. We couldn't use, so we needed, um, because we're using the geometry in, in the Paley graph over the extended generating set, right? Then we obviously need, it's the, the words W hat have to, um, the normal form has to treat the words w, w hat well, right? The derived words. And so we, we're not really interested in making the, the words themselves in normal form geodesics. We want the, the derived words corresponding to the words in normal form to be geodesics. We want the derived words to behave well. And so the nice normal forms that you can get for relatively hyperbolic groups, which are geodesic or whatever, which you build out of, you know, when, the para, when you have geodesic automatic structures for the parabolics, you can make geodesic languages for the whole relatively hyperbolic group, can't you? But that's that doesn't work for us because it's not the the words in normal form that we need to be geodesic. It's the corresponding derived words. So it was really tricky to build the um, automatic structure. And, and if you look at the the work of Antlin and Chabano, then they you know they fiddle around with the generating set. They 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 the generating set has to have all kinds of nice properties, right? So so we had to fiddle around with our generating set and give it all kinds of nice properties. So we had to extend our generating set X to make a nice generating set that had lots of good properties in order to build our automatic structure. And that just gets ever so much more complicated if you allow torsion in your abelian groups. I mean, it's not necessarily impossible, but it's going to be harder. And now you're going to ask me if we can, if we can extend to, to virtually abelian. Uh, yeah, no, no, uh, yeah. And, and that's going to be even worse. Uh, all right. Yes. If not impossible, but but we think we might be able to deal with um, abelian rather than free abelian. But going to virtually abelian is 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 one step more complicated. And this was already so we don't know if it's possible. It's building the automatic structures that's really that's really the problem. So if you, I mean, it's not clear to me how much it's torsion that was the problem in the abelian versus torsion free abelian is if you did torsion free virtually abelian with and short lex automatic for the subgroups do you think that would have any hope well i think i don't know i mean bioautomatic structures for virtually abelian groups are are much worse than bioautomatic structures for abelian groups aren't they so we've got that to deal with i suppose um so 
I think, to be honest, I, I, I think we only just got to grips with the with 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 this proof, um, and 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 we keep finding, um, yeah. I mean, looking at my notes for this talk today, I I, I found new typos. I think in in our current paper. Um, so it this is. It's still very. So it's a difficult, blue. yeah, and technical result, certainly. It is. It's very technical. Yeah. It was a nightmare to write it down. Uh -huh. um, and um, okay. I mean, yeah, as, as you can see from the fact that I think that the um, the other result is on the archive now, but we, we've um, we've managed to get ours out before theirs, haven't we? So it it really is a nightmare to write it down. Um, as you can see, there are still typos on my slides here, which I'm very sorry about. Um, it's just very, very fiddly. And um, I mean, we believe it's correct. We do believe it's correct, but it's very, I think the referee believes it's correct too, but it's very, very fiddly. It's, it's, it was a lot of trouble to get the details right. And a lot of trouble to, to write it down. The notation is, difficult to okay. all right uh, are there any other questions okay let us thank sarah again thank you oh, oh. of the official recording now so it's thank you pretty long uh, uh.